we are in need of his salvation. We are in need of his intervention. And so we come for this week to facilitate the renewed consciousness of the art of prayer. Lord, we ask that the lifting of our, of our hands will be unto you as an evening sacrifice, an evening oblation, that you might look upon the earth and have cause to have mercy and to bring salvation to us, even your people. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Acts chapter 4 verse 23. An ancient culture, an ancient custom of the early believers, the early church, that we must, by all means, emulate. Acts chapter 4, verse 23, the Bible says, And being let go, they went to their own company and report, reported all the things, all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard it, this was their reaction. It was a report of a persecution. It was a report of an attempt to hinder them. This was how the early church attended to the challenges that they faced. When there was a report of what was going on, there was a report of the people that were setting out to resist them, they turned to the Lord in prayer. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God in one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all that is, all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David had said, Why did the hidden rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For if it truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Israel. Now, verse 31 is interesting, but I would like to explain what I just read. Because the instrument that was used by the chief priest in an attempt to stop the advancement of the gospel was the instrument of intimidation. The instrument of intimidation. There were threats. There were intimidations. And the prayer they prayed was, oh, All right, Lord, there's an attack on our courage. There's an attack on our confidence. There's an attack on, on our masculinity in the spirit. So grant that with boldness, with my speak thy word. Let us not speak your word ordinarily let the spirit of boldness come and overtake us and in keeping with that prayer the bible says in verse 31 which is the response the feedback and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the holy ghost and speak the word of God with boldness. You will not expect that having received that kind of threat, the reaction that should take place thereafter was that a fresh, a renewed boldness. And I, I, I want to imagine that the people that threatened them heard the way they were praying. 
<laughs> it means that the trust did not achieve anything. The early church had one resort. Anytime there was pressure, anytime there was a challenge, and the resort was the place of prayer. And one of the things that was responsible for the level of confidence that they had in prayer was that they all corporately saw the potency, the effect of the prayers that they prayed. They saw it. You will not be someone that believes so much in prayer if you have not seen the effect of prayer. While these guys were praying, uh, the Bible says that the place where they were sitting, it was shaken. The foundation of that place was sh It's not physical, spiritual sh shaking. It was shaken physically. The alignment of the foundation was affected. And I've seen, there was this brother those days um, uh, in boarding school, secondary school, that began to pray. And the foundation of the building shook. He's still alive today. So those dimensions are not too far from us. So this is literal, the foundation. I don't want to call his name, some of you know him. But the foundation, the foundation, he shook of the building. He shook. There was a certain man that prayed, and he was in a hotel room while he was praying, and then suddenly uh, the foundation of the hotel shook, and the, bu the building now was tilted in one direction. So that hotel had to be evacuated, and for so many years, it was not used again and it came to pass that the person he was praying with because the man eventually died the person he was praying with that the foundation shook now grew in prayer stature went back to that same country went to that building said ah my father prayed and this place shook so may i pray now let it go back and the building was restored the engineers checked it it was in alignment and then the hotel began to operate again after many years the foundation shook there is nothing as powerful as you being a first-hand witness of the power of prayer now what we are trying to do during the course of this week is is to afford everybody the opportunity to rebuild prayer altars that are falling down for us to get set back in the mood and in the position of prayer so that we can begin to corporately generate the kind of energy that is required to turn the hand of the devil backward. Now to take us further, I bring my son again, another, my, it's a choice one, Apostle Michael Urokbo. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Such a great honor to be here this evening to share with us. Thank you, sir, for the privilege of being a blessing to God's people. Our lives would not have had meaning except for our encounters with you and your investment in our lives. We may not be able to reward you in time, but we are persuaded that as God helps, in the days when you are old, we will stand with you like the mighty men of David. In Jesus' name. Father, we give you praise for tonight. We ask that you open the valve of our souls and infuse us with the energy and the life and the power that emanate from the throne. We come under the government of your throne, we come in the spirit of brokenness. We ask that by all means, you will grant us access into depths of wisdom and life. That our feeble vessels will be invigorated. Strength will come upon us and will become mighty in stature to advance your counsel in this day and time. Take all the praise, take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Ah, 
Mandala Kavayas Sehila Mahavis Neas Kavahali Hanai Eas Nivakabus Sekalia Ravana Sizai Kamano Sefalaya Ino Sama Heli Gazua Fevele Sezania Haka Sefale Yeriana Mahas Kahaya E Sesane Suwa Abroso Salima Haya let the waters of life flow from the chambers of our spirit. Abra savana brahada vele gazash. Yezezele barina savaya. Ah savraha sevele manus. We give you praise. We give you glory. We are in a strategic time in the calendar of God. The earth and humankind is a product of the wisdom that emanated from the bowels of the divine. Before time began, when the immortals dwelt amongst themselves, God, being a being of love, decided to fabricate a dimension that could interact with his reality. The Father and the Logos and the spirit commune with one another before time began. A point came, love wants to share. So the divine decided to embark on the journey of creation and that was when it became necessary for this visible realm to be designed. And having created this realm, it was impossible for the creation to interact with God because God is fire and he's unapproachable. It was impossible. You could not come before him because he is a consuming fire. So he took divinity another time, aeons that cannot be captured in time, to think how can creation relate with me? Because it happens to be that if you look into the scriptures, you will realize that even the angelic realm, they could not have fellowship with God. The 24 elders that are the closest in proximity to the throne, Every time Yahweh shows up, they fall on their faces. You can't behold him. The glory and the radiance from his bowels, it consumes. Every time he shows up from the east gate, Lucifer cried, Yahweh cometh, Yahweh, and the whole heavens go down flat. But this being, when he began the project of creation, his goal was intimacy because he's a being of love. How can creation ever interact with me? That was when by wisdom he, he went into himself and came out with a technology of intimacy. And that technology is what resulted in the creation of man. So glory was encapsulated in man, but every time, Creation interacted with that man. It was a gateway into the divine. The only way you could access God, the only way God could be seen and touched was by the instrumentality of that being called man. This was a position that Lucifer desired. He said, I will exalt my throne and be like the most high. But it was not given to the angelic realm. And when he saw that that privilege was given to man, the only thing he could do was to bring deception because he knows that what causes a creation to fall off the heights of glory is the spirit of rebellion. 
And when man rebelled against the divine, that intimacy protocol was broken and the earth began to spiral into destruction. Because the safety of the earth was not a function of the direct interaction of God. Man was in this world to preserve the realm. That's why when Adam was in Eden, there was no earthquake. When Adam was in Eden, there was no landslide. His alignment with God preserved the visible universe. The moment he fell, creation began to spiral into oblivion. Creation cannot stand unless it is possible for God to interact with creation. And man happened to be the only gate. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 that in the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden. The word in the cool of the day is not time. The word is ruach. Ruach yom. It means the time of the spirit. The moment of encounter. The time of intimacy. That was what held the visible realm together. The moment of the spirit when Ruach HaKodesh walks into the garden. But intimacy had been broken. The earth had one sentence, judgment and destruction. Even the man could no longer interact with the divine. Until the protocol of salvation was consummated and man was restored back to God. But the earth, the sequence of destruction had been set in motion. And until the end comes and the earth is judged, it will be impossible for that dimension that God had in mind to come again. It is when the earth is judged that the new Jerusalem will show up. But it happens to be that we are in a moment, we are in a strategic calendar when the activities of the last days is beginning to unfold. And there are seven categories of activities that will happen. The first is the great falling away. Because many we fall under the spirit of deception and they will depart from God. That is what is called the mystery of iniquity. Because he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 6, he said, the mystery of iniquity now walketh. Iniquity is not necessarily sin. Iniquity is a state of godlessness. So that is what the great falling away is about. The devil will bring deception by the instrumentality of lust. And many will be cut off from God perpetually. Permit me to go into science a bit and explain what I'm talking about. You see, the design of man is such that he is spirit, soul, and body. So through the senses of the spirit, the soul, and the body, he can traffic dimensions. His spirit traffics the realm of God. His body traffics this visible realm and then the soul is the gate through which the traffic takes place. Apostles have taught us that the spirit is made up of intuition, communion and conscience. The soul, because of the fall, is now recategorized into different dimensions of lust. The soul is made up of the will, the mind and the emotion. The body which had five senses, have now been recategorized into the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So man, through intuition of his spirit, can interact with, with the mind. So the reason you can pick frequencies from God is because your mind can interact with the gate of intuition. The reason you can sense the Holy Spirit is because your emotion can interact by the communion. The reason you can do the will of God is because your will can interact with the conscience. So that is the traffic channel between the soul and the spirit. The body is supposed to have a navigatory path where the energy of life that comes from that intimacy relates with the world and the earth is colonized. But now the body has been reconfigured. So what lust does is that it draws man away from God. So the lust of the eyes interacts with the mind and it pulls you away from God. The lust of the flesh interacts with your emotion. It pulls you away from God. The lust... The loss, the pride of life interacts with the will and it draws you from God. So, so long as the man live by the new economy of the soul, which is lost, the man will be perpetually departed. So what the world is up to is to create different sets of intelligence that maximizes the powers of lust. And at the end of the day, man will depart from God, never to be able to return. The climax is what we call the mark of the beast. When you take it, God can't redeem you because you have journeyed forever. 
and there are different scientific infrastructures and intelligences currently going on to maximize the powers of lust and take man away from God eternally. You hear of genetic intelligence. What's the idea behind genetic engineering? Is to reconfigure the DNA helix to make the man a superhuman that no longer has need for God. The gene is remodified and the man becomes a superhuman. He has no need for God. Why would the man want that? Lost is at work. Currently, there are researches going on by reason of quantum mechanics in, in, class, in, 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 in quantum chemistry. You, you see that the, the, the electron is in, in the orbit because of the centripetal force and the centrifugal force that holds it in the place. That's how the earth revolves around the planets. They are believing now that if you can harness energy from other dimensions apart from the earth, the earth can absorb energy enough and have a quantum leap so it will migrate from where God put it. And if the earth migrates, the ordinances of this world will collapse. These are different types of deception that prospers because of lust. A man wants to become a god. Unfortunately, it happens to be that your body is an antenna. You are an electromagnetic antenna. Do you know why you enter a room where the quarry and you know? The energy has been altered. So you can pick it. It's electromagnetic radiation. Do you know why you come for a service? When the anointing increases, people begin to fall and you interact. The energy has been altered. So you can pick it. You are, you are an antenna. The same way science currently is developing antennas to manipulate the soul structure. So if those things are activated, you will want to serve God, but they can channel frequencies in your direction and you cannot control yourself because you will pick the vibration. But man is on this bead because he wants to be independent from God. That is what you call the mystery of iniquity. Dimensions of intelligence that will separate man perpetually from God. He can't return anymore. Your body, your brain releases electromagnetic impulses. Your heart increases electrical impulses. The cardiac muscles function by electrical impulses. The brain cells function by electromagnetic impulses. You can be chipped with a, a, a chip and that chip can hybridize with you and you become a machine. You can't choose God anymore. It's the mystery of iniquity. So instead of arguing, I see a lot of people arguing pre-tribulation because they want to escape. If you can't stand the lust of now, if you are in the days of the tribulation, you can't stand. The great falling away, a function of, of the mystery of iniquity. And the second thing that happens is what we call the great awakening. The great awakening is what results when the gospel of the kingdom is preached. It's not just the gospel of salvation. It's the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel that brings you under the government of the spirit. You begin to live by the energy and the life that proceeds from the realm of God. The gospel of the kingdom is a gospel that enslaves you to the will of the king so that you become an extension of his reality. And the only way men can enter into the reality of that gospel is when lost is tamed. Lost must be tamed. This is what the great awakening is all about. So the first level of preparation, which is one of the most significant reasons for priesthood, is the ability to harness the world back to the Christ. Is evangelism by power. Power, not by mental capacity. Power, because you enter into heaven and you can secure verdicts. He say, have dominion. How can a man have dominion? Dominion is the verdict of intimacy. Because the man mingled with God. God spoke and said, have dominion. That's why Psalm 2 verse 8, he say, ask of me, I will give you the hidden. For an inheritance the uttermost part of the earth for a possession you ask for the nations before you preach to them you can't preach to a nation that you have not asked for in prayer isaiah chapter 2 verse 2 he said in the last days the house of god remember jesus said my house shall be called the house of prayer 
the house of God shall be on the mountain of God. He shall be exalted above all his and all mountains. And he said, men of all nations shall say, let us go to the house of God that he may teach us his ways. For out of Zion proceeds the law. So they are returning back to the law of God. The gospel of the kingdom is the unveiling of the laws of God back to a world ruled by iniquity. And the only way that happens is when men ascend the mountains of God. This is why you are not a preacher now unless you are first of all an intercessor. A lot of people argue scriptures because they think it's an intellectual enterprise. You have no voice. People will be hearing your message and fornicating. They will be hearing your message and drinking and say, wow, this man's a big preacher. <laughs> this man shall be preached because there is no power. Ha sefona sesalia mahana skida. Yevos, there is never a time where the world was redeemed from iniquity without prayer. The Bible said in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, God gave another seed to Abraham in the place of Abel that Cain slew and his name was called Seth and he said Seth had a seed and he called him Enosh and he said then men began to call upon the name of the Lord redemption of a word of iniquity begins when men begins to call on the name of the Lord without intercession there is no gospel in the last day the gospel in the last day is not Bible exegesis. It is power. It is power. Power that is born out of prayer. You can't conquer the world if you don't contend, contend for it in prayer. He said, rise ye up. Take up thy journey and go beyond the river Anon. Behold, I have given unto you Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon. Begin to contend with him in battle and subdue him. You contend in prayer. You fight for the nations. You fight for the souls. Until you win them in prayer. When you speak, even if you say God loves you, they will bow. The greatest of men were men of prayer. And Noah found favor with God. You will think Noah sat down and found favor. It is in Genesis chapter 8 verse 20 that you realize the reason Noah found favor and became the salvation of the world was because he was a man of the altars. He raised altars. So it was by his incense that he caught favor with the immortal spirit. How do you please this unending oracle? How? It is by lying and prostrating before him day and night. The sacrifices of God are of a contrite heart. And of a broken spirit. Men that go down in prayer. They have checked and discovered. The flesh profited nothing. I have no power. I can speak good English. But nobody is saved by good English. What enters their spirit is a convicting power. That shatters the mystery of iniquity. The guy is not sinning because he loves it. There is a force that binds him in sin. He says if our gospel be healed. It is healed to them that are lost. Whom the God of this world have blinded their heart. How do I take that veil away? It's by contending in prayer. It's by contending. That's why Jesus, the word of God. The Bible said in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life was the light of men. But that light could not save the world. He was the word. He was God. He was creator. He was light. But the land of Zebulun was still in darkness. So before he began to preach, he went for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he came down from the mountain, even before he altered his voice, in Matthew chapter 4 verse 16, he said, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people that sat in darkness. They sat in the shackles of death. So they were not sinners. They were captives of death. And the only way you could pull them out of the shackles of death is when you have a verdict from the throne. And only men of prayer travel that far. So you reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh. Kadosh. 
you are mighty on your throne. Ha. You run. You run. You run. You run. Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. The salvation enterprise of the last day is an enterprise of prayer. There is so much we cannot achieve unless we pray. And when we pray, even the host of heaven become partners with us. The Bible said in Revelation 5 verse 8, it said the prayers of the saints, they ascend to all heaven as others and they are stored in golden vials. So on the strength of that prayer, God has legality to hit the earth realm. That's why Jesus appeared in heaven. He said, Paul, Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus can preach from heaven because there is a bank of prayer. Somebody has created an opening. An angel can hit the earth realm because there is a bank of prayer. When they prayed in Matthew chapter 12, prayer was made of the church. An angel showed up and carried Peter from the prison and liberated him. When angels partner in evangelism is because incense have gone to heaven. The prayers of the saints. Priesthood is the salt of the earth. Any man who preserved this earth was a man of prayer. Go and study the scripture. You reign. You reign. You reign. Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O oh fountains of the deep. Cry out, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. The men of old were wise men. They knew what to do. They knew what to do. They knew the cries of iniquity in Sodom have risen to me and I am going to destroy it. Genesis chapter 8 verse 19 and a man of prayer rose up. Will the God of all heaven destroy the righteous and those in iniquity? Will the God, the just God, he knew intercession in the corridors of heaven. This was a, a judgment that was perfected, concluded in the annals of eternity. But a man on earth by priesthood could change it. What if you find 50 righteous men? Say, if I find 50 righteous men, I will spare the city. What if you find 40 righteous men? What if you find 30? What if you find 20? He stopped at 10 because he thought Lord had learned something. But unfortunately, all Lord knew to do was to raise cattle. He didn't know that the prosperity of Abraham was born on altars. In Genesis chapter 12 verse 7, the moment he entered Bethel, he built an altar. In Genesis chapter 12 verse 18, the moment he shifted from Bethel, he built an altar. He littered everywhere with altars. That's why his prosperity is invincible. You can't fight him. And Lord could not raise ten righteous men. He was there, his soul was grieved. But he didn't know anything about priesthood. This is not a time to show that you know scriptures. It's beautiful. But make sure your altar is alive. Else you are a talker. You have no witness. I know a lot of people running everywhere writing things. <laughs> One of the nine voices in the courts of heaven is the voice of the church of the firstborn and that voice is the voice of intercession that is what gives us the right to participate in that realm the first preparation is the preparation of power evangelism many must be brought back to the kingdom and the only way we can do it is to shatter the forces of iniquity the second preparation is to gain stamina for yourself in the spirit by joining through prayer into the holy of holies. <laughs> what you know in your head will fly the moment there is crisis. It is what you carry in your spirit that we speak. When you see a man under pressure, that's what you know the stuff is made of. Many can talk, 
But what re-engineers your inner man is the light of the presence. If you can't journey there in prayer, you are at risk. You will know a lot, but you will float away like the chaff before the wind. How do you stand in the counsel of God? It's when you travel there for yourself. In Romans chapter 8 verse 9, Paul said, you are not in the flesh. He said, you are in the spirit. If you have the Holy Ghost in you, you are in the spirit. But in Galatians 5.26, Paul began to speak. He said, if you are in the spirit, then walk in the spirit. Prayer is a migration into the presence. Prayer is a journey into intimacy with God. Prayer is a progression in the spirit from the standpoint of weakness to where you are enveloped by the energy of the divine. In Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28, he says, have you not heard? Has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not? Neither is he weary. He giveth power to the faint unto them that have no might. He increased strength. But he now began to compare the everlasting God with man. He said, even the youth shall be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. The reason is because the glory of the young man is his strength. But he's telling you that the strength of man will fail. That's why he said, in that day, no man shall stand. He said, woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck. He said, men's heart will fail them because of fear. Let them that are in Jerusalem run to the mountain and tell it to cover them. No man can survive. The only way you can survive is when your energy, your weakness is exchanged for that of God. And the young man that shall faint suddenly is a day that wait upon the Lord. They mount up with wings like the eagles. That mounting up is when your weakness is exchanged. They mount up with wings like the eagle. And suddenly say they will run, they shall not be weary. The young man was destined for weariness but he has waited and when he waits weariness is exchanged for strength the way we survive the strategy of eternal preservation is the strategy of priesthood if you can't wait you can't stand only men of prayer can stand on in the day of the lord it's like the old tabernacle the gate is the office of the Christ. It reveals the four dimensions of Jesus Christ. Blue, white, scarlet, and purple. The king, the servant, the son of God, and the word of life. By the finished works of Christ, you are brought in. But the moment you enter the gate, you begin the business of priesthood. The first thing you do is that you latch onto the horn of the altar. Because you will notice that you are weak. And if you hold on to that place, this is why we pray and most times flesh begins to fight. But men who don't understand, when flesh fight, they give way and they are never strong. What it means to hold on to the horn of the altar is a, a realization, like Paul said, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence. The man that holds to the altar he has judged the flesh and he has concluded that in himself he has no strength. So he will stay there until help comes. And when help comes, you meet the lava because from the gate you have the altar of, of, the, the altar of, of, of sacrifice. From the altar of sacrifice you have the lava. The lava is the ministry of the Holy Ghost. Then the Holy Ghost begins to carry you into reality. That's when you enter the inner court. Many Christians are in the outer court. They are singing, I am saved, but they are living in secret sin. Our Father in the Lord told us that the triangle of life in the spirit is secret purity, strict righteousness, and generous kindness. This dimension is not for everybody who is born again. It's for men that have traveled to the secret place. How far have you traveled is what will determine whether you will stand. Because from the great awakening, you have the great tribulation. From the great tribulation, you have the rapture. From the rapture, you have the return for the battle of Amegidon and the millennial reign, then the white throne judgment. Your coming to the secret place is to build stamina to survive the great tribulation. 
many will not survive because all they know is in their head. They can't travel deep in the spirit. They can't travel. We will hold on to that horn in prayer until that thing that wants to pull us away bows. And the moment it happens, you sense a ventilation. That is you interacting with the Holy Ghost. It's like the lava. It washes you and then it brings you to the inner court. When you come to the inner court, you don't struggle anymore. Because at that time, your, your inner man is fed. You have the altar of shoe bread. That's when you begin to eat of the word of life. Suddenly, you came weak, but that energy came, comes on you. The first time I experienced it, I was tired and sleepy. I wanted to pray. And I knelt down and said, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. I thought I would doze up. And suddenly, the light came out of the wall and entered me. And before I knew it, I was there for over six hours. I said, what happened here? I was fed of the bread of life. I ate something. I ate something that was outside my flesh. You want to know strength, you must travel into the inner place. The secret place is the place of strength. How much of the bread of life have you eaten? Elijah was weak and vulnerable and the angel stood up. He said, rise up and eat for the journey is great. He ate and slept again. Rise up and eat. The journey is great. And when he ate on the strength of that bread, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. The men that can go through are the men that are fed. They are the men fed of the word of life. That's why Jesus, when the devil was coming to tempt him, he went ahead of the devil 40 days and he fasted and prayed. When the devil showed up, he thought he was tempting him. Everyone he speaks, there's a rema word that just flows out of him naturally. He is being fed. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. When you are confused, it's because you have no bread. When you are weary, it's because you have no bread. Every time there is crisis, go back and lock the door. As you overpower, the dictates of flesh, the Holy Ghost comes and ventilates you and you begin to feed of the bread of life. And when God feeds you with the bread of life, the next thing that illumination hits you. You know, they journeyed with him many days to Emmaus and he was talking. They could not even recognize him until he broke bread and their eyes were open and they recognized him. When you begin to eat the bread, you enter into illumination. That's when you see the menorah. The menorah is the seventh government of heaven. The government of the Lord. The government of his wisdom. The government of his knowledge. The government of his might. The government of the fear of the Lord is the menorah. So suddenly you interact with different dimensions of the powers of the age to come. You can't be confused anymore. You can't be deceived. You can't be drawn away because you have a light that is not the sun. Those who are in the outer court, their illumination is the sun because the outer court has no covering. It is the sun. The problem with the sun is that the sun darkens. In Psalm 121 verse 6, he said the sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. Why? Because you have entered the secret place. But if you are in the outer court, the sun will darken your heart. The sun is the wisdom of this world. And he said the wisdom of this world is first of all sensual. That's why in Songs of Solomon chapter 1 verse 6, he said, look not upon me because I am black. He said the sun has looked upon me. There are many pastors that live by the philosophy of the internet. They want to teach, they go goggle scriptures on the internet. They are powered by the sun. That's why you will be shouting fornication, hell. Yet the people will live in it. Because you don't come with light that proceeds from the government of heaven. You have no illumination. You will be darkened. They are talking flesh, yet everything emanating out of them is pride. They are darkened by the sun. Because when man fell, he lost the powers over the earth. And the prince of this world now rules the earth. He is called the prince of the power of the air. He can manipulate the constellations and he will darken the souls of men. Anything that brings illumination outside of the menorah is a sign that you are in the outer court. What you need to do is to go deeper. And the way deeper is the way of prayer. So priesthood is the part, the instrument of eternal preservation. Can you live above the sun? 
Why do you think most of us are afraid? Is the news we hear. But if we heard the breaking news of heaven, we will be like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. When the menorah illuminates a man, the only thing that comes out of him is worship. At this time, he has nothing he can pride himself in anymore. The prince of this world come to me and find that nothing. At this point, the powers of my emotion have been loosened. The cord of my will have given way. The things they taught me when I was young, I have forgotten the philosophy of my ancestors. I have forgotten the philosophy of the world system. Before I came here, I used to think that the Igede man never gets married to the thief woman. But you see, I have forgotten that philosophy. My heart was darkened, but I am purged by the, the, the light and the government of the menorah. Before I came here, I thought ministry was money. I thought it was breakthrough, so I was zealous. But a point came when I checked, my strength had been taken away. So I have become a puppet in the hand of God. I can't move until he moves me. At that time, you have become worship, an instrument of worship. Worship is not a good song. Worship is the ability to yield to the dictates of the Spirit of God. So he flows out of you effortlessly. It was a person that showed us spiritual paralysis. When God wants to function, he can't function because you, are, you have your strength. You are not an agent of worship. But when you are fed of the shoe bread and illuminated by the menorah, you can rise up to go to Egypt and he will say, Stay still in Gera. Stay still in Gera. So everything that comes out of you is an offspring of deity. Ministry becomes an offspring of deity. Many, they produce things by their intercourse with the world. They call it ministry. They call it, do you not know that most of the things we call ministry today is Babel? It's men building a name for themselves. And God will crush Babel. Babel must go down. Anything that is not born of your intercourse with the Holy Ghost is not the offspring of God. He cannot pass the test of time. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, he said, when the judge of all shall appear, he will judge the intentions in the heart of men. What motivates, what powers, what inspires what you build? If you don't enter the inner court, anything you build is a product of this age. And it will burn by the fires that come from the eyes of God. That's why he said, having received a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us receive grace to serve God acceptably. There are many kinds of service that is not acceptable. The only service acceptable is the service that is powered by grace. Daddy was sharing with us, he said, you can be worshipping on this altar, but you are moving by your mind. By your mind. There is, it doesn't resonate in Zion because grace has no signature on it. And anything not born of grace will be born by fire. The fire will burn it. And your life would have been a waste. Preparation is coming into intimacy. Your words, your actions are born by intercourse with divinity. That's when God can vet your work and say, well done, thou faithful servant. Many came, said they casted out devils in his name. He said, go, I know you not. You are workers of iniquity. You didn't travel to a point where you will be illuminated. A man of God said, grace is the supernatural power to live above death and corruption. Your will can't stand it because your will is compromised already. Your soul traffics energy from this world. It receives vibrations from this world. The only way you can come to a point where you give expression to things born in the spirit is when by prayer, you journey into the secret place and your life becomes worship. Your life. God has the right of way over you any day, any time. You have no possession. Even the money in your account, you become a trust fund. Yahweh can show up and say, sign out that money for that project. When you are young in these things, like some of us, you will cry. But every time you want to pray, you will hear, give it out. 
because you can't go forward until that government breaks you. When everything about your life becomes worship, then you are promoted to the secret place where you only see by the Shekinah. You know, the, the Holy of Holies have no light. If you come by God, if you come by the incense, because after the altar of incense, which is worship, you come into the ambience of the Shekinah. The Shekinah is where the absolute government of God is. That is why priesthood legislation doesn't begin until you come to the Holy of Holies. That's where the government, the seat of government dwells. Many people stand up and say, we do this, we do, nothing happens. Because we do this, is in the flesh. As simple as ministration, healing the sick is, sometimes we are doing things for flesh. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Legislation, litigation begins when the Shekinah appears. That's when the priest pours the blood upon the mercy seat. It's a dimension called before the foundation of the world. It's a place where no corruption can travel to. If we don't journey to that point, there's no hope. So as we evangelize the world, we must teach the world the, the way of prayer. We must teach the world how to travel until we come under the government of his presence. Because that's where man was created to rule from. Dominion is not outside of Eden. It's within the ambience of Eden. You can't have dominion outside of Eden. Everything outside of Eden is the, is the city of Nord. And God does not have a hand in it. In obedience to God. Is the Holy Ghost, Spirit of the Living God? Is the Holy Ghost, Scepter of the King of Kings? Is the Holy Ghost, Spirit of the Age to Come? Is changing everything. In obedience to God. If we ask ourselves, what is eternal life? We will say eternal life is a life that doesn't fall sick. If we ask ourselves, what is eternal life? We will shout that is immortality. But Jesus said, this is life eternal. That you may know him. Eternal life is the experience of God. An experience that brings you to the God class. So, a life of divine health is not eternal life. Divine health is an offspring of eternal life. Immortality is an offspring of eternal life. Eternal life is the life that makes a man come to the class of God. And that is possible by experience. Because the word that you may know him is the word ginosko. Ginosko means the experience of God. You explore him in the secret place. He re-engineers you. He re-engineers you until your walls are seasoned with salt. This is why Jesus didn't say pray for the sick. He said lay hands on the sick. What, what is happening? What is flowing from you is the life of God. You have become one through intercourse, through intimacy. This is life eternal. Legally, the death of Jesus and his acceptance procures it to your spirit. But the experience makes you become it. Paul said this is the mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy 3.16 He said that God became flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was revealed to angels. Preached in the world. Accepted of Gentiles. And received unto glory. It's a circuit. A circuit that brings God out of glory. To carry a race back into glory. That is eternal life. The mingling of man with God until he is swallowed up by his dimensions. If you become a God kind of man, you don't fall sick. So a sickless life is not eternal life. A sickless life is an offspring of that intercourse. Immortality 
is an offspring of that intercourse. But that kind of knowledge comes when you travel to the Holy of Holies. So the first preparation is to deliver the world from the great falling away through massive evangelism. The second preparation is the journey into intimacy so that you can withstand the great tribulation. And the third, the third preparation is the preparation of bequeathing yourself with eternal reward. The finished works of Christ does not give you reward in eternity. It is your works that gives you reward in eternity. And the only work that appears in eternity is a work devoid of flesh. It's a work that is powered by the Holy Ghost himself. This is why when you come to intimacy, God kills the flesh. There is no technology of killing the flesh. The only technology of killing the flesh is the presence of God. He said in 1 Samuel 15, 33, and Samuel healed Hagar to pieces before the Lord. It is before the Lord that flesh is swallowed up. So if you don't come there, you cannot exchange flesh for divinity. And if flesh still rule you, you have no reward in eternity. So the final preparation is the preparation for the judgment seat. Where men are given their rewards. Many will sit on thrones, but others might remain in outer darkness. Who are they that shall be in the new Jerusalem? They that have been purified. Their garments have been purified in the blood of the Son. This is why at the end, it becomes a reality of intimacy. He said, the spirit and the bride say, come. You come to a point where you tame flesh. You tame it. He said, God opened the windows of heaven. And he opened the fountains of the deep. And all flesh was drowned. When that, that envelope, that intensity of the presence comes, it begins to mortify the flesh. The flesh is killed by the presence of God. That's the preparation for the judgment seat. The preparation for the judgment seat is the preparation of eternal reward. And it is a place prayer carries you to. Your prayer must bring you. Isaiah was a prophet. He became a national prophet until the king that supplied and powered his loss died. And he said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And the moment he saw the Lord, something happened. Isaiah realized that he, saw, he was a man of unclean lips. That is a national prophet. How did he now saw that? Is it now you are realizing? Yes, because now you can see yourself from the sea of glass. You can see yourself before the, the mirror of liberty. So you were a smart prophet on earth, but before the sea of glass, you are a man of unclean lips. And he said, woe unto me. That's a national prophet. He had never traveled to the presence. He came for the first time and they began to judge his flesh. And this, the seraphim touched his tongue with the coal of fire. That was when he began to prophesy about the Messiah. Because the cardinal responsibility of his prophetic ministry was to bring the message of the Messiah. But a man of unclean lips could not preach it. You can call names and phone number, but you may never preach the message of your ordination. Until flesh dies. Until flesh dies. This is how men will journey past the tribulation. When the plagues began, after the third plague was released in Revelation 6 verse 6, he said, touch not the oil and the wine. The oil and the wine are the men that have exchanged flesh for the life of God. You can't touch them. Proverbs 23 verse 29. Who is it that redness of eyes belong to? They that tarry long in the wine. You tarry there until God fills your vessel. Everything that is flesh is lost. You can journey into the throne room. That's why Apostle was reading a while ago from Acts of the Apostles. They troubled them. They put fear. These guys, they, they think the devil attacked was their boldness. And they became feeble. But when they prayed, when they prayed, he said they were baptized again. Another layer came upon them and suddenly boldness was swallowed up. A dimension in the spirit called Sophronismus was activated. Ephesians 2, 7. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but of boldness, of love, and of a sound mind. They began to tap into the frequency of God. It's called Sophronismus. 
living above the mundanity of flesh because you have crossed the veil of the divide. You have passed from death to life. You have been soaked in the waters of the spirit. Your life is an expression of God. There is no flesh anymore. Everything that comes out of you is a mirror that reflects God. He said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding us in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. It's a re-engineering. Flesh is taken away and God is revealed through a man. So when you see that man, you are interacting with a dimension of God. A man can show up and he becomes a reflection of grace. A man can show up, he becomes a reflection of the anointing. A man can show up, he becomes the reflection of help. You will think he's foolish. If he doesn't help, he can't rest. He is lost. That thing in him that thinks of self has been taken away. So he sees himself in others. And until he helps others, he can't have peace. Flesh is gone. Flesh is gone. This is what the men of old pursued after. They pursued. They pursued after it. Abraham, the Bible said he was the man of the altars. Everywhere he came, he latched there until flesh is taken. Lord didn't know. He showed up. Their headsmen are battling. Abraham said, pick anywhere you want. I'm not moved by anything time and space has to offer. I have seen him that is invincible. And the guy saw the plains of Sodom, full of green grass and vegetation. And he went to Sodom. And Abraham went back to where he lives from. And God said, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. We don't see the plains of the earth. We see the plains of Zion. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. And the earth was given to him as a possession. Daniel was in Babylon. You will think the greatest honors of Babylon is to become a prince. Many fight in church for position. They have not seen him that is invincible. The king said, I will make you the president among the princes. Daniel said, make Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego princes. I will sit at the gate. There is something I want to behold every day. It is Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And he said, three times in a day, as his custom was, he lifted up his eyes and he prayed facing Jerusalem. That was superior to Daniel. For Daniel, it was more important than the title and the honors of a prince. Beholding Jerusalem, where he can see the beauty of Israel. Three times in a day, the Holy Ghost began to teach me. God told me there are functionaries that have been released into this earth to teach men God. Anybody that prays now, we know God. There is an energy level that has been released upon the earth on account of intercession so that men can latch on to God. These were dimensions the patriarchs walked in. Lift up your eyes. He said, as at other time, and God began to teach me. He said, three times in a day. Daniel prayed around 9 a.m. in the morning. That was when Jesus was crucified. So flesh is dealt with in the morning prayer. Daniel prayed by 12. That is the ninth hour where salvation is granted because he saw the woman of Samaritan at the ninth hour and he gave her salvation. That's when Daniel interceded for Babylon because salvation is at that hour. He had entered into an educational system that was not written even in the books of the prophets. He knows when the message of salvation comes and Daniel prayed by 3 p.m. in the evening. It is the time of the evening sacrifice where oblations are lifted to God. The God that kills your flesh and empowers you to bring others to salvation. You worship him. And three o'clock is the moment of encounter. That's why Daniel grew so much in the prophetic. Once upon a time, he needed to go and consult God. But the day came that Daniel doesn't consult God anymore. He has lived there to a point where he can come out with it. And the, the prince, the king called him. He said, God gave your father a throne. And a kingdom that spread all around the world. But you decided to worship the God of iron and of stone. He said, therefore, is this hand come? They could not even read the writing. How did you know? You were not there when the hand came. How did you know it was a hand? Because when that verdict was passed, he was there in that court session. It's not news to him. He came from where the hand came from. And he said, mene, mene. Take care of sin. 
Today your kingdom has been weighed in the ba- you have been weighed in the balances and your kingdom has been divided among the medics and the patients. And that night the king lost his kingdom. A man that knows how to dwell in the presence. How was Moses able to run from Egypt? They say he saw him that was invincible. How was Abraham able to give Isaac? He mounted El Shaddai. What is El Shaddai? Upon the mountain the Lord shall be seen. El Shaddai is the mountain one. When he entered there, Abraham saw beyond Isaac. He saw Jesus. He saw him. And Jesus said, Abraham, your father saw my day. And he rejoiced in it. Abraham knew the seed was not Isaac. This Isaac God can raise him back in a figure. I have seen something that is eternal. Because he mounted El Shaddai. This man traveled in God until they entered into dimensions and possibilities. I read about Moses, I almost cried. Moses, at the age of over 80, every day he climbed Sinai. Mount Sinai is 7,490 feet tall. How can an 80-year-old man climb such a height? It was hunger for the presence. He knows that's where flesh is exchanged. He mounted stones, he fell off, he climbed again. And sometimes after climbing Sinai, for six days, God will not show up. He will be waiting. And one day he came down. The Bible said he wished not that his face shone like the sun. The man had become a God. God told him, I will make you a God unto Pharaoh. But that manifestation came after he began the business of Sinai. That was why Moses knew God so much. That he was the one that brought the revelation of Jehovah Zaphaniah. The word Jehovah Zaphaniah is the God that hides himself. The God that dwells in the dark. There was a man that knew God so much that even when God hides himself, he can find him. When God descends in a dark cloud, Moses knows he can find him. Whereas Aaron need to prepare for eight months to go before the mercy seat, Moses goes there without the blood. He had become the law. When you look upon him, he's a dimension of God. The question tonight is how prepared are you? How many souls can you bring into this kingdom? When your voice is heard, what is the echo in the hearts of men? Do you have the power to bring the convicting presence? Because the spirit of God came to convict the world. But that conviction comes when God thunders through the voices of men. What is the vibration that comes from your voice? Do men hear your message and increase knowledge? Or they hear your message and they are quickened? It's where you speak from. Afarana Savaya Seseliba Bahas Venekaya Sovela Manaria Sivas Ese Sevias Marano Sevas Akaya Somaya Ese Variana Suba He, he didn't call us preachers. He called us witnesses. The word witness is the word matos. Maturayo is a matire. A martyr is not just a man that is beheaded. A martyr is a man that dies daily because he lives to please the interest of his king. You cannot witness to a dying world if you are part of them. The first thing that qualifies us, the preparation that qualifies us is to journey through, in, through priesthood into the secret place until our dimensions begin to appear. When I listen to our father, I pursued the spirit because I was caught up. I didn't intend to follow. 
I was a proud young man when I, where I came from. I had potentials. I would have been sent out of this nation long before now. But I heard a voice. It shattered my, my lust. He killed it. I, I came here. I said, what is this? But I couldn't go back. The reason we can keep people in the kingdom is because there is an anakazo dimension from our voice. It is the compelling force. When we speak, it is the thunder and the thunderings of the voice of God. It divided the flames of fire. He divides it. We are witnesses. How much debt can you take? How much? How much debt have you experienced? John was a preacher for many years, but in his dying age, he was cast to the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos. The word Patmos means the mountain of my dying. The place of my dying. And in Patmos, he said, I was in the spirit on the last day. The guy has died to everything. Like Paul, he counts everything as dung. I was in Patmos in the day of the Lord. And I heard a voice. The moment he began to write that letter, he said, anybody that reads this is blessed. What do you think the fathers pursued? They pursued intimacy because the patriarch himself that was what he pursued. He said in Isaiah 51, he said, Hearken unto to him, all ye that loveth after righteousness. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that body. I called him alone and blessed him. What was the part that the patriarch pioneered? Walk before me and be thou perfect. So God was their ultimate demand. God was their ultimate possession. Moses had seen all the powers. And God said, I will send my angel and say, no. If you don't go, we will not depart from here. So power was not his obsession. God was his obsession. The reason we are weak is because we have not seen him. He said because Moses saw him that was invincible, he endured. There is an energy to stay and to bet that which is in the heart of the Father. Our garments must be dipped in the blood. We must come back under the government of his presence because it is not just about being raptured there is a word after there is a word hereafter and that is the word for champions they that overcome they that overcome they that overcome tonight we will pray for God to grant us grace to prepare one of the major things priesthood does is that he prepares us for the days to come have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul? cleansing blood of the Lamb. Your greatest asset is a purified soul. It's a soul that can stand before the judgment seat of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I don't know why this word keep, keep coming into my spirit and it may be for someone. The Holy Ghost is telling me He said the significance of the parable of the ten virgins is the level of preparation the foolish virgins knew that the bridegroom was to come at midnight so their preparation ended at midnight but unfortunately the bridegroom delayed somebody may be here thinking we must be raptured before the tribulation the bridegroom might just be delayed so wisdom in the last day is to prepare with extra oil. Don't be deceived. It's better to prepare for the great tribulation and you are pre-raptured than to prepare for pre-rapture and the bridegroom delays. You may not have extra oil and you will be stranded eternally. It's just a word of counsel. I know a lot of arguments are there 
but it's a word of counsel. There is not one clear scripture that talks about the pre-tribulation, but there are over three clear court scriptures that doesn't need interpretation that talks about the post-tribulation. Prepare with extra oil. The bridegroom might delay after midnight before coming. God bless you.